Today, I am super excited to bring you a very special episode on my channel. I'm going to analyze a uniquely complex and haunting composition by one of the greatest film composers to ever put pencil to manuscript paper. Regardless of whether you came to my channel because you like my Beach Boys or other chord progression analysis, or perhaps my sci-fi progressive music production and songwriting tutorials, or any of the territory in between, I am saying to all you musicians and songwriters watching this, you are not going to want to miss this lesson, trust me. Please bear with me as I must first lay out some foundational prerequisites before I can properly dive into this score. You might initially think my examination of this song is too long, but the material is thick and unpacking it is no easy task. My hope is that by the end of this video, you will have deemed my exposition as pertinent. The composition in question is from one of the greatest film scores in history. It is called Scene d'Amour, or Love Scene, and it is the achingly beautiful climax from the classic movie Vertigo, directed by Alfred Hitchcock and composed by the inimitable musical talent Bernard Herrmann. Briefly, Bernard Herrmann was an American composer and conductor who died in 1975 and was mostly known for his suspenseful film scores, of which he wrote about 50, including many for Hitchcock, things like Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo, and so many more. This guy has been referenced and ripped off by so many of the insipid Hollywood schlock film composers of our day, none of whom can hold a candle to his talents or do much more than hint at devices Herrmann used in a very superficial way. Herman was known to have committed himself to a creed of personal integrity at the price of unpopularity. He was the quintessential artist. His philosophy was summarized by a quote from Tolstoy that says, Eagles fly alone and sparrows fly in flocks. Thus, Herman only composed music for films which he was allowed the artistic liberty to compose what he wished, without the director getting in the way. This was the cause of the split with Hitchcock after over a decade of composing scores for many of the director's films. Bernard Herrmann said about himself, As a composer, I might classify myself as a neo-romantic inasmuch as I have always regarded music as a highly personal and emotional form of expression. I like to write music which takes its inspiration from poetry, art, and nature. I do not care for purely decorative music. Although I am in sympathy with modern idioms, I abhor music which attempts nothing more than the illustration of a stylistic fad. And in using modern techniques, I have tried at all times to subjugate them to a larger idea or grand grander human feeling. It is in the nature of cinema itself that it needs music. The theater doesn't need music really, drama on the stage, and a certain amount of uh, live television doesn't. But the minute you do a, a story that is done on film, music becomes almost imperative. Please take a moment to help me grow this online community. It's really tough to gain much traction these days, but by hitting subscribe below, ringing the notification bell so you know when I release new videos, hitting the like button, and leaving comments, you help me tremendously in my efforts to reach more people with this channel. If you feel so inclined, you can even leave me money tips below, which are called super thanks. Pay a visit to my YouTube homepage and hit the playlist tab to see the various categories that I offer, and you can easily navigate to the subjects that most interest you. From the various types of instruction in my music theory, production, and songwriting, all the way to my various original music projects, it is all clearly laid out on the playlist page. You can also sign up for my email list on the front page of my website, timsmolens.com, to stay informed about all the latest happenings. If you enjoy the content I put out on this channel and want to take this type of learning to the next level, while at the same time providing some financial support to my efforts, then please consider joining my Patreon called High Castle Conservatory. In addition to composing music for the standard orchestral palette, Herman was known to use unique elements such as a theremin in The Day the Earth Stood Still or nine harps to create the underwater soundscape in his score for the 12 Mile Reef and things like that were all over his discography. Herman was influenced by the polytonality of Charles Ives. He clearly had a love for Stravinsky and Bartok, as evidenced by his intense string arrangements and unique unorthodox timbres. I also can hear a lot of influence from impressionist composers like Ravel and Debussy in his chord voicings that almost seem to hint at jazz before there was jazz. Jazz not meaning like swing or any of the scales they use in jazz, but there were chord voicings that I would hear in Ravel that I'd be listening, and that's a 13 chord right there, and things like that. Half diminished chords. Scene d'Amour from Vertigo, which I will cover in this video, embodies a sense of dark beauty and romance, as well as suspense. Herman's ability to have beauty and darkness coexist was remarkable. His use of chords unusual to the classical genre is noteworthy and almost gives the listener the sense that he understood jazz harmony. 
Vertigo is now recognized as Hitchcock's most personal project, a disturbing study of romantic obsession, guilt, and death. Detective Scotty Ferguson's obsessive love for the elusive, doomed Madeline Elster and her apparent double, Judy Barton. When it came to filming Vertigo's emotional climax, the scene in which Ferguson is reunited with Madeline after convincing Judy to make herself in Madeline's image, Hitchcock told Bernard Herrmann, we'll just have the camera and you, meaning the music. True to his word, the director kept dialogue to a minimum, knowing that Herrmann could convey more effectively the emotions of this troubling complex film. The resulting five minute sequence may be cinema's most powerful evocation of romantic longing as Madeline steps out of a ghostly green light to be embraced by Scotty as Hitchcock's camera travels a full 360 degrees around the lovers. Scotty's literal embrace with death is given another layer of meaning by Herman's theme, which is a paraphrase apparently of Wagner's Liebestad from Tristan und Isolde. I don't know if I said that right. What is interesting about Herman's score is how the obsession of the film takes a back seat and the longing comes strongly to the forefront. It almost aches to listen to the soundtrack. Alex Ross, a music critic for The New Yorker, pointed out how tonally rootless the score is. It never finds its footing, tonally, leaving the listener feeling a bit lost. Please take a moment now to familiarize yourself with the original piece of music from the film. Take note of the plasticity of the tempo that the conductor is leading. That is something we don't see much in rock-based music or any music with drums and beach, which usually stays in a pretty consistent metronomic tempo or employs rudimentary tempo changes at best. But the tempo in this song is all over the place and it adds so much emotion and feeling to the music. Take note of the amazing string writing and the chords and melody that are both gothic and beautiful. This version that you see on your screen now is a great version for you to hear, and if you are unfamiliar with the song, I think you will get much more out of my lesson if you hear it first. Also be sure to check out the Odd Time Spy Jazz arrangement of this song that my former band Astratosphere played live, which you can hear on my channel in this video that is appearing on your screen right now. Before I dive directly into analyzing the chords and form of this song, it is necessary to establish a few things first. This is nothing like analyzing a pop song, a Beach Boys song, a Morricone song, or really any other song I have undertaken. There are polytonal aspects of this composition that render analyzing the particular key of a passage somewhat futile in certain places, but I will attempt it anyway, even though there are times when it is not super useful. The tune never really settles into its home, which I am going to call A minor. The corresponding major key to A minor, which we call its relative major, is C major. And I have gone back and forth about whether I should place this piece in A minor or C major. And while there could be some advantage to both, I will call it in general an A minor, but I will also do my best to point out the interconnected relationship to C major. And there are times in the chart where I have placed it in C major briefly. Let's look real quickly at the main theme of this song, Seen to More, from the movie Vertigo. The theme consists of two chords and a simple melody that are continually restated in diverse ways. We have A flat over C, so that would be like... But they have a sharp 11 or a flat 5 in the melody, so it sounds like this. And that second chord is an A minor with an add 9. You can also tuck that 9 down here. You could call it an add 2. I like calling it an add 9. So we have A flat over C with a D, which is sharp 11 in the melody, to A minor 9. And the voicing for A minor 9, we'll get into it later, but it's real close there. And there's not always an A in it, but you know that that's what he's hinting at. Sounds really nice down there. I have discussed in previous videos about the case-by-case -case basis of deciding if a melody note should also be called one of the chord extensions or not. Sometimes it sounds better to have a melody note supported by the chords, and other time it sounds better for the note to stand out on its own without the chords echoing the note. Take these two chords for example, the A-flat over C. If I said sharp 11, and everyone who was going to play a chord, you know, not that there's a lot of chord instruments in the orchestra like there would be in jazz or something. If I, if I called this chord A flat over C, but the melody's also playing at, we just don't need that. Now there's too much sharp 11. So in this case, I'll call it just A flat over C. I hear the sharp 11 standing out so strong in the melody that it doesn't need to be supported by the chords. But the A minor add 9... 
we do really need it because although the melody starts on that nine, it quickly goes down to the five of A minor, which is E. So you still need that B in there. So in this case, it's a great case by case basis example because the first one, I absolutely did not want to call it A flat over C add sharp 11. I'm just going to call it A flat over C. And the, on the second chord, A minor add nine, I'm definitely going to call it add nine because I think it's really important in the voicing that that is there, that real close, that close dissonant, but intriguing and beautiful harmony. So yes, it is a case by case basis, chord by chord, where I'll decide if the melody note really needs to be justified in the chord or not. And sometimes it's a bit of a judgment call when transcribing music, because a melody will often trick the transcriber into thinking the melody note is one of the chord tones. I have fallen for that many times. I transcribed this song mostly by ear from the soundtrack recording and did not have access to the score, so there may be some small errors here and there, but I'm confident that it is pretty darn close. When you take something like that minor, that A minor add nine that I just had, you know, when, when you give these chords to jazz musicians, I swear to God, they add a seven every single time. And I, you know what? I love a minor seven chord just as much as the next guy or a minor nine, meaning it has a, a seven and a nine in it. But I don't want it there every time. So that's why we use terminology like add nine. If I say A minor, add nine, there is no ambiguity that we're only adding a B. I didn't say anything about a seven. But if you say A minor nine, not the word add, it actually means minor nine and minor seven. So that word add can be really useful for you composers out there when you want to get real specific and make sure those jazz people don't ruin it for you. Let me make the disclaimer that this song presents many enharmonic difficulties, and when I say enharmonic, it means do I call something G-sharp or A-flat, even though those are the same note, in certain keys you're supposed to call things certain things so that everything gets one letter. I did make some judgment calls about whether I should call the chord G-sharp over C-flat, since we're in the key of A minor, or A-flat over C because you're not supposed to have two A's. And although the G-sharp over C-flat would be more enharmonically and technically correct, since we are in A minor, I elected to use what looked better to my eye. Sorry, I can hear some of you grumbling already, but I am aware and just made an aesthetic decision there. So if we are in the key of A minor, how the heck is the first chord of this song, A flat major over C, related to it? Because it's not in the key of A minor, or even in the key of its relative major, C major. There's related major and minor keys that are separated by a minor third. If, if A minor is our key, you go up a minor third to find its relative major of C. If you're in a major key, you go down a minor third to find its relative minor of A. Let me briefly show you my transcribed chart that I will be using to analyze this song on the screen. Many of you have seen this in my other videos before. A sunshine means a new key, so that's not a chord we're playing. Every time we see these new suns, that means a key was changed. Uh, if there's a heart next to it, it kind of means it's flirting with that key at the same time. In this case, I did include the melody. I don't always do that. In this case, I thought it was going to be rather useful. These sections here in, in squares are section names, so it wasn't useful like a pop song to say verse and chorus because this was kind of more like a classical music film score, so it's not really that useful to use that. So I named them in the standard way of like A, B, and then, you know, I might say like A2. If it comes back to the same section, I would call that A2, but if it's a totally new section, you know, I'll go to a new letter like D. So yeah, the sunshines are new keys. The Roman numerals indicate what function the current chord has of the key that we happen to be in. All the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. This is a pretty thick score. You can see it just keeps going and going. It's about six pages. This is going to take me a while to get through this song, but I think you are going to learn a ton from this as this does not fall into any usual category of pop, rock, jazz, or even classical. This is totally its own beast. The one other thing is you'll see it says 8VA at certain times. 8VA until noted. Uh, classical musicians know that means up an octave. So up an octave until it's noted. And then you'll see somewhere down here I'll say no 8VA. So from that point on, you're back in a regular octave. It was easier than writing all of this way up here in the clouds. Other than that, I think this is all pretty self-explanatory. Let's quickly review the diatonic chords of A minor, which we derive purely from the scale tones of the A harmonic minor scale which goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G sharp, A. It 
If we build triads from every other note of the A harmonic minor scale, we get A minor, B diminished triad, C augmented, D minor, E major, F major, and G sharp diminished triad, then back to A. Now, if we make four note chords diatonically in A minor from that same harmonic minor scale, by using every other note of the scale, we get A minor with a major seven, which is like the mysterious film music espionage chord. That's called A minor with a major seven. Then we get B minor seven flat five, otherwise known as half diminished. We get the mysterious C major seven sharp five, which is basically an augmented chord with a major seven, so we call it major seven sharp five. On the fourth degree, we get a somewhat normal chord, a D minor seven. That's kind of a relief. Fifth, just like any other, even a major scale, we get the dominant seven chord. That's the one dominant comes from the fifth scale degree of both minor and major scales. Fifth degree, we get E7. Sixth degree, we get F major seven. And then the seventh degree, we get a G sharp diminished seven or fully diminished, four notes. And then back to A minor. We also do not need to just use every other note of the scale to build diatonic chords. You can use any note of the scale and it's considered diatonic. If it's not in the scale, it's non-diatonic. That A minor add nine is diatonic, but it doesn't use every other note. It has two right together. From the sixth degree of A harmonic minor, five, six, that F, you get that F major. You also get the F major seven, but what's more, you actually can do diatonically a, a, an F minor. Those are all notes completely within the A harmonic minor scale because there's a, a B and a C in the scale or an A and a G sharp. So that, that sixth degree is the secret flexibility of A minor is going to that F and you could do F major, F major seven, F minor, and even F minor six, you can do so much from the sixth scale degree of minor, which in this case is F, because we are in A minor. This diversity that's available at the sixth position of A minor, which is F major, F minor, F major seven, or F minor six, gives the sixth position a fantastic harmonic flexibility. Getting back to the first two chords and main theme of the piece, we have... that A flat over C. To A minor add nine. So how on earth does the A flat major as the first chord of this song relate to A minor? There is no A flat major diatonically in A minor. And yeah, why is this even in A minor? Why am I saying if the song starts on A flat major, with a sharp 11 in the melody and it's over its third, which is C. Well, it is not an obvious connection at all. So bear with me for a bit while I try to explain this. Some pieces of music are more harmonically abstract than others. And to analyze the tune as tough as this, and figure out its tonal home is not easy. So if any of this is foreign to you or sounds out there, that is only because the harmonic language of this piece of music by Bernard Herrmann, maybe his best piece, is very abstract in itself. So it's hard for me to translate it. Since the relative major of A minor, you go up a minor third to find relative majors becomes C major. You go down a minor third to find relative minors. So the relative major of A minor is up a minor third, and it is C major. Let's look at it from the perspective of C major for a moment. Let's play a C major chord, and let me point out the obvious, that the most important note in the key of C is C. If we use the idea of reharmonization, any chord that has a C in it is significant to the key of C major. 
Initially, you have to find the diatonic chords of C major that have the note C, and I can build straight from the C major scale. So of C major, C is one. The four, F major, C is the five of F. A minor, C is the three, the minor three. D minor, C is, C is the minor seven. You can also use non-diatonic chords that have C in them, but are not entirely built from notes from that C major scale. Here's an example of reharmonization where I keep the note C, but I change the note chromatically up from C through all 12 notes. Let's see if I can justify C in all 12 notes. Now this is kind of off the cuff, so bear with me. So C, we're gonna start on C. How about C major, go up a half step, C major seven. C is the major seven. Go up a half step, D, C is the minor seven. Up a half step, E flat, C is the six. Up a half step, E7 sharp five, C is the sharp five. Up a half step, F, C is the five. Up a half step, F sharp seven flat five, C is the flat five. G7 sus, four, C is the sus four. A flat major seven, C is the major third of that. A minor seven, C is the minor third of that. B flat nine, with a dominant seven. C is the nine of that. B7 flat nine. C is the flat nine. Then finally back to C. So I went up all 12 notes chromatically and I justified the note C existing in all of those. Whatever I did. All of those chords have C in them and it is really not hard to utilize these non-diatonic chords because all of these ripe reharmonization possibilities do exist right there in the scale. Yeah. So if we are in C, C is the one of C major. C is the five of F major. C is also the five of F minor. So common to do a four minor in pop music. We've been over that before. C is the minor third of A minor, but C is the major third of A flat major. So they all are connected. There's the first chord of the song. We are so used to hearing one as the first chord of the song, but what if you just come in with a non-diatonic chord, an A flat major over C, with a sharp 11 in the melody. So there it is. Even though A flat major is not a chord you can derive diatonically from C major, because two of its notes, A flat and E flat, are not in the C major scale, it is a major player in the key of C major because of that connection of the note C that I just pointed out. The C is the major third of A flat major. This songwriting device in pop music is called the flat six major because if you play a major chord from the flat six of any major key, memorize this, you get a non-diatonic chord whose major third is the one of that major key. So again, we were in C. If I keep that note C, but I go to the flat six major, a non-diatonic chord, it justifies that C. To reiterate it one more time in hopes that it sinks in, in C major, the flat six major, a non-diatonic chord, is A flat major and contains the note C as its major third. So the major third of the A flat major is C. This device of using the flat six major has a long history in pop and rock music and definitely helps to spice up a bland composition. Oftentimes the resolve note of a melody is the one of the key. So anytime you are going to resolve to the one chord, and the note is on one. So we're in C there, going four, five, one. And I have C in the melody. And instead of going to one, I could go to flat six.
So anytime you're in major and you resolve to the one and have one in the melody, not three, not five, just one, you can instead go to flat six. That's something you can keep in your back pocket as a possible device. Let's be in C. Let's do the simplest thing. Let's go four, five. Then let's go one. We resolve to one. One's in the melody. Let's do it one more time and then resolve to flat six. Four. And flat six instead. It's just a different sound. It's a great little trick to have. You don't want to abuse it though, let me tell you. Let me give you a few examples from pop music history and I will put them all in C major so you can see how they relate to C major and to A minor and to that A flat that's not in either one of those keys that's the first chord of this vertigo scene to more song that I'm telling you is in the key of A minor. Let me show you a few examples from pop music history of how this device of the flat six major is used. You've all heard this before and wondered, what was that chord? What was that they just did? You might have heard Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly where he broke out of his... He broke out of his typical one, four, five and went to the flat six major. Let's do a few examples. Uh, I thought of a few before because there's so many. I saw her standing there from the Beatles. I'm going to put it in the key of C so we're in the same key. It goes C to C with E in the bass. And then 4, F, and then instead of going to 1, it goes to that flat 6, A flat. So it goes, never dance with another. Here it is. And let me tell you something. Almost every time it hits that flat 6 in any of these songs, you're going to notice that that 1 is in the melody. So we're in C here. So that note, when he goes to A flat, the flat 6, is he goes up to the is C. Oh, that was a little out of tune, sorry. One more time. I'll never dance with a four. Flat six. Ooh, C. And I saw her standing there. How about More Than a Feeling by Boston? It's usually played in G, but I'm going to play it here in C to keep a continuity. I'm trying to channel the spirit of Kurt Cobain there. It's more than a feeling, more than a feeling. You feel that something, more than a feeling. Totally diatonic. I think I'm dreaming, more than a feeling. Here it comes. The C Mary and walk away. Because the note C's in the melody. And it even resolves up to A minor 7 and keeps the C. I see my Mary and walking away. Really cool though. It's totally just staying in diatonic. You just think this is boring. And C Mary and finally flat six and C's in the melody. They do this all the time. How about the Beatles PS I Love You? As I write this letter, that type of thing, but mm, treasure these five words while we're together. Take all my love forever. P.S. I love you. You. That even got into some of that Mario Brothers stuff right there. If you're in a major key, you could always go down to that flat six and do that Mario pole when, when you finish the level. I can't play it, but... That's C. Then you go down to A flat, climb up a whole step to that magical flat seven, which I have talked about in other videos, to C. Speaking of the Mario pole climb up, that stupid uh, Motley Crue song, you know, Home Sweet Home. You know I'm a dreamer, but my heart's a goal. I gotta run away high, so I won't come home low. So that went one to one dominant to four. But finally it goes to flat six. I'm on my way. Look at the note, it's C, just like always. Has there been one song that it hasn't been C that has justified that flat six? I'm on my flat six, it's C. I'm on my magical flat seven. Home, sweet home. The last thing I'm going to explain, and this is maybe the most important lesson of all these songs, is from my now defunct band, Astratosphere. 
we once wrote a black metal song called The Silent Elk of Yesterday. You can see it. It's this video on the screen here. It's actually a really good song. The main chord progression of that song utilizes all of the secrets I've just been going over for the last 15 minutes. So the main chord progression, it's in A minor, so I don't have to modulate the key. A minor. And it goes to that six. Remember I said six was flexible. It doesn't have to be major. It can be minor. In this case, it's A minor to F minor, which is the quintessential black metal chord progression. A minor, F minor. Now A minor, now A flat major. That's it right there. Flat six, F minor, A minor, A flat major seven. That's the chord that that vertigo starts on. So to summarize all that, since A flat major, a non-diatonic chord in C major, is very useful in C major because it has C as its major third, it's also useful in its relative minor of A minor because C is the minor third of that A minor chord. In general, using some non-diatonic chords is a great way to get some variety into your compositions. And this A flat major being abstractly related to C major and to A minor, because they all contain the note C, is the perfect example of that. Look how amazing the two chords of this main theme are. We are in A minor and therefore also in C major because they're relative major and minor and they are intimately connected and you can't change that. And the first chord of the song is A flat major but over C in the bass with sharp 11 or flat 5 in the melody. That sounds like this. So the bass motion gives us that classic. But it isn't the progression we usually hear, which is C major to A minor. It's actually a totally unique one that I've never seen before. When the ear hears this pattern, it often fills in the blanks with the obvious chords. So the obvious chords would be, but in the case of vertigo, it's not the same thing at all. The bass notes C to A would usually indicate that classic doo-wop progression of one to six. But in this case, it's A flat major over C with sharp 11 in the melody to A minor nine. So in case you haven't figured it out, I don't use these to just show you how to play a song. I use it to show you the little tidbits of knowledge in there that you can use in your own songs to help make them more colorful. That's why I spend such a long time on what might seem like some to a tangent, but for those of you who are really watching, no, it's not a tangent because I'm showing you how they relate to each other. Now that we've laid out the foundation of this theme with just these two chords, And I'm calling this song in the key of A minor and related to it, it's relative major of C major. And it begins with a, an apparently unrelated chord of A flat major that is actually connected to the key of A minor and C major because the chord A flat major contains the note C as its major third. I know I've said that a lot, but I think it's really being driven in. I will proceed to analyze the rest of the chords of this unbelievable piece of music, one of the greatest compositions I have ever heard. There are certain spots in this piece that are hard to peg into a key, and I will point that out as I go, and I do my best to place it in the key, but I love to analyze stuff, and I love when things fit in a neat little box, but some of the greatest mysteries of life are things you can't quite fit in that box. So as much as I would love to nail every single one of these chords in this song into a little box, 
I actually appreciate more than anything those times when I cannot do that. So I will point that out as I go through this song that, you know, this is some BS and I don't know if this is in any key at all, but whatever. I try to conceptualize it in a key just for the benefit of understanding it, but I do embrace that idea that you can't always fit everything inside of something that you understand. And I'm pretty sure that the way I'm analyzing this is not how the composer Bernard Herrmann conceived of this. But I hope he would at least appreciate that someone is taking the time to do this with his music because I haven't seen anyone else doing that. So now I'm going to do the entire six-page song, which is very complex. I'm going to try to get through it in a timely manner and show you how crazy this song really is. Like I said before, sunshines indicate a new key, not a chord to play. Anytime you see that sunshine, it's what key we're in. The Roman numerals say what function the current chord has of that key that we're in. So I've told you already that the song starts on A flat, but we're in A minor, and that A flat is non-diatonic, so how do we even know we're in that? But it starts with three notes from the melody before any chord plays, and it goes E, G, B. I've mentioned this in other videos. Sometimes you don't know what key you're starting in until you see what key you end in. So me knowing how this song ends, it actually ends in C major. Only a few times in the song does it ever rest on that C major and let you know that that's what we're really in. So what do you know that the first three notes are? It's E, G, B, which you would think E minor. And maybe it is E minor, but I think more likely because the song ends in C major, and this doesn't do modulations that go up a half step and that type of thing, it is actually of C major, E, G, B. If we're really staying true to A minor, we would call that you know, a five minor of E minor. But I think really, since the song ends in C, first three notes are three five major seven of C and then we go to the song so it goes A flat over C so you can see that sharp 11 is in the melody of A flat and then over the A minor 9 the 9 is in the melody but it drops down to the 5 of A minor then it repeats that and goes that is such a Bernard Herrmann trick. So if you're looking to add some exquisiteness to your major chords, go to a sharp 11, go down to the major three, and quickly go down to the minor three. We're, not ta we're taught that A major and A minor don't work at the same time together, but look at this. And that wouldn't be possible if we were in C major because that sharp 11 is not in the key of C major. But since A flat is our first chord, and that's not the one of the key, we're in A minor or C major. Sharp 11, 3, 9, down to 5. Sharp 11, 3, flat 3, 3, 9, down to 5. So just remember that. Over that A flat over C. Sharp 11. It adds a, a bit of mystery to the major chord. So after we do those two in a row, like this. What a left turn it takes right away. Okay, what on earth happened there? It goes A flat minor to F minor twice. A flat minor is not in the key of C or A minor. F minor is, remember the flat six or the six of, remember the six of A minor is F and it can be F major, F major seven, F minor, whatever you want it to be. But I can't really explain this minor and there's no major or minor key in the world that holds up to minor chords that are a minor third apart. But if you study cinematic music, you have heard the idea of minor chords moving in minor thirds. And I'm not gonna say it's a rule, but it's a bit of a mystery. Let's say I'm an F minor and I move up in minor thirds with minor chords, F minor. A flat minor, B minor, D minor, B minor, A flat minor. 
there is this murder you can get away with harmonically if you move minor chords in minor thirds. So I think in this case, what it does is it goes to A flat minor add nine, which is not A flat major like the song started on, but it quickly goes down to that sixth scale degree of A minor, which is F minor. And it moves in that mysterious minor third Hollywood cinematic thing that I just talked about that I want to demonstrate to you a little more. Only really great pop composers could even incorporate this weird minor third rule. And one of them was that that Doors song, Alabama song, which was actually written by the great Kurt Vile, one of my favorite composers. Oh, show me the way. A minor. To the next whiskey bar. Go down a minor third and play a minor chord. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. So in all of 50s and 60s music, it went A major to F sharp minor, not A minor to F sharp minor. That almost doesn't exist. So there is a weird, I, I'm only telling you all of this because I don't know how the heck he arrived at this weird minor third thing from A flat minor add nine to F minor add nine and made it work, but it is so cool. The, the one other song I can think of that employs this is another Kurt Vile song called The Ballad of Sexual Slavery, Weird Thing. So let me just play the main melody, and I'm going to tell you where it gets to moving three minor chords in a row in minor thirds. I've never seen any other composer pull this off like he does. minor E flat minor G sus but but three notes in a row A minor C minor E flat Kurt Vile Bernard Herman they get away with this stuff people that really know some of these weird cinematic chord progressions I can't explain to you what the theory of it is but just know that you can move minor chords in minor thirds and pretty much get away with murder so anyway, let's take it from the beginning, and I want to show you how we get to that A flat minor to F minor, and the nine is always in the melody. So we have A flat with sharp 11 in the melody, A minor add nine, nine five. That weird minor three to major three. Now A flat minor add nine with the nine in the melody. Nine in the melody again. Again, do it again. Nine in the melody. Now we go right back to A minor and do nine in the melody. E7 flat nine. And the cool thing about that E7 flat nine is the, the one is actually up in the melody, which usually you have flat nine up in the melody. So it goes. Again, A minor nine, add nine. We go to G minor 7 flat 5. Chromatic and then F minor with 9 on top. D flat with 9 on top. B flat with 9 on top. Okay, do you not see that Bernard Herrmann is the absolute master of 9s that are not tucked up here? They're actually, you could call them add 2s. I prefer calling them 9. You can call them add 2. I'll call them add 9. You do what you want. So Bernard Herrmann has used all these chords in this thing. Wow. <laughs> this is some deep stuff, seriously. So let's take it from um, that B section. See the section number? Don't call that the chord B or the key B. It's the, it's the section name of B. Everyone take it from B. So we've got A minor add nine with nine in the melody. F7 flat nine with one in the melody. Again. And we brush on that major seven of that, make that espionage chord. Let's do the G minor seven flat five with, with minor seven in the melody. Chromatic on top. F minor with nine on top. D flat with nine on top. B flat with nine on top. G7 with flat 9 on top. G minor 7 flat 5 with minor 7 on top. 
C759 with the three on top. And then we have D flat with nine on top again. B flat with nine on top. He is the master of the add nine. G7 flat nine with flat nine on top. G, G minor seven flat five with minor seven on top. C7 with E on top. And finally we get down to So that falls into that next section. Taking it one more time from that B section and playing it all the way through if I can. into this totally different section which we're going to cover now okay so we're heading into section c and to get there we did now i'm just going to tell you i just gave up on trying to put this section in a key i think he was just going for a vibe and it's similar to that weird flat thirds Hollywood trick that I showed you. He, he starts on an A flat minor, so I was thinking about putting the whole thing into A flat minor, but finally I just said, you know what, I'm keeping it in A because he's done that A flat inside of A minor before when he went to A flat minor to F minor twice. And I just don't think he's that serious about a key change. And let's just go with that because it, it didn't make a lot of sense. It The first chord is an A flat minor over E flat. Then we have an F minor seven flat five. So that has the same notes as A flat minor six, just a different bass note, exact same notes. Memorize that, minor seven flat five and A flat minor six are separate by a minor third. So after the minor seven flat five, it goes to what I would call an E nine. It's got no five in there. E nine is very similar to B minor six. Then it goes to an E seven over D, which is really just a diminished triad and then back to a voicing of F minor seven flat five, and then an A flat diminished triad, and then an F minor seven flat five over B, and then an A flat minor seven flat five over D, which is same notes as B minor six, and then back to another F minor seven flat five, and then an A flat minor seven flat five over D, and then right back into the theme. A little page turn there. So it does that theme twice, right? And finally it goes to same chord, A-flat, but different. Four of A-minor, five of A-minor. So anyway, it goes to this new, slightly new section, which starts on A-flat again. What do you know, does sharp 11 on the melody, but goes to four and hits nine in the melody, what do you know? Then dominant seven. Minor with nine on top. And then finally, A minor seven, A minor six, sharp four, five, and G with sharp 11 in the melody. So you get to this weird little section where it does just some chromatic passing tones. I justified it in the key of A minor. I just called it a flat five to a five minor. I didn't want to say it changed keys. I think it's just doing chromatic passing tones. From, so, so from that A minor. G with the sharp 11. What 
a great little variation on that. modulate to the key of G because it's clearly doing one two whereas before remember we were kind of an A minor with our whole now it's doing and now it does a pure G7 and it does every cool note of G7 flat 9 9 13 5 flat 9 9 13 5 now it goes back to the original progression, but it keeps that key of G that we were in. It just keeps rumbling in the bass. So even though there's G down here, it still does. It still keeps it in G, which is so strange. I, I don't know how many of you have ever done anything like that. It's, it's totally bitonal, in fact, because remember, this is an A minor or C major, but we were just doing a thing where we were in G major. One to two in G major. Then we did this tough dominant part. Now it goes back to the original progression, but keeps it bitonal in G. Again. Now it keeps that, that G7 thing. G7, except for that little 2-5 and F minor there, but I think it's just all G7, and it does a little quarter note triplet, it finally resolves to C right there, see that, it goes to C. So we're at part E right now. We're in the key, what I'm calling C instead of A minor, and we do flat six of C to six of C, flat six of C, finally one. We haven't done this in the whole song yet. And then we get this whole Bernard Herrmann chromatic climb type of thing. We modulate to the key of E flat major. So coming out of the Finally resolving to C, it gets this brilliant descending part. So what it does there is it resolves to the key of G. And it does an A minor like we're familiar with, an A minor add nine, but it goes to the seven of G, which is an F sharp minor seven flat five, which is kind of similar to a D nine, but that's not what they did here. They did the F sharp minor seven flat five, otherwise known as half diminished. One. E7 sharp 5, which is 6 dominant of G, but it's also 5 of A, which is where we're heading. So it's bitonal there for a second. We're all bitonal for a second. So coming out of that descending section, now back to the beginning, the theme and C again then back to that A flat D minor which is 4 of A with 9 in the melody sharp 5 in the melody and then that whole minor 7, 6 sharp 4, 5 G with sharp 11 in the So 
modulates to the key of G major. And now it does a 2-5 in C. It's so cool. And then it goes into the key of B flat and goes A minor 7 flat 5 with 11 on top. E flat major 7 with major 7 on top. B diminished with 11 on top. F major 7 with major 7 on top. G minor 7 flat 5 with minor 7 on top. So one more time, that is in the key of G, 1 to 4. Now 2, 5, and C. In the key of B flat, tough run. like before in the key of G resolve to C So the last part just comes out of there, does that part like we did before, does a two in G, a seven in G, which is a minor seven flat five, and then a one in G, and then an E seven, which is a six dominant in G, but it's also the five of A where it's going. Thanks a lot for checking out this video. Come join me on my Patreon. You can learn more about this type of stuff. Go check out my former band Astratosphere's version of this song right here. Or check out the original here. For those of you more adventurous listeners and those who want to see what happens when I put all my skills and knowledge base into practice, check out my current project, High Castle Teleorchestra, which is a sci-fi, progressive, genre-defying group with otherworldly instrument combinations and is made up of a distinguished cast of international virtuosos. Warning, High Castle Teleorchestra can be rather intense at times, but if you are intrigued by wildly creative arrangements steeped in advanced chord progressions, innovative production that is honestly the best work that I have done, then take the plunge into our debut record the egg that never opened you can pick it up as download only stunning double lp 180 gram 45 rpm gatefold vinyl or a collector's item 20 page double cd digi book on bandcamp or on highcastleteleorchestra.com to get a taste of this truly unique group, watch our video on YouTube called At Last He Will, which is a largely instrumental rendition and innovative arrangement of one of famous Nazi-era German-Jewish composer Kurt Weill's tunes. Thanks a lot for watching this video and taking an interest in my channel. Please help me reach a larger audience by hitting subscribe below and ringing the notification bell. Check out my video playlist page to find the categories that most interest you. Leave me a super thanks here on YouTube, and even better, come join my Patreon. Please consider buying music for my original projects ISS and High Castle Tele Orchestra. Also, don't forget to sign up for my email list on the front page of timsmolens.com. You can find information about all of those things in the description below. Thanks again.